another very exclusive club in the NFL, 2,000 yard rushers. Only seven men have ever done that in a single season. And the next man to be enshrined here in the class of 2017 is one of those. It is Broncos great Terrell Davis. Terrell, of course, in many ways, a generational player like Gale Sayers was, who was brilliant, phenomenal, game-breaking, but sadly saw his career cut far too short because of injuries. A lot of people held that against Terrell Davis before he got into the hall. But more, here's a guy who has the all-time record in NFL history for most average of playoff yards in a single uh, career, 142 yards per game. And now we go to Chris Berman. We have the MVP family. running backs. Terrell Davis. He was the 196th player selected in 1995. Sixth round by the Denver Broncos. Pretty good pick. 1,000 yards as a rookie, 1,500 yards in 96, 1,750 and 15 touchdowns in 97 when the Broncos upended Green Bay in the Super Bowl. And 2,008 yards in 1998, becoming only the fourth in history to reach such a vaunted plateau. It was an MVP season all the way around. TD had 21 TDs. TD was MVP. And Denver flirted with going undefeated, finishing 14-2 rolling to their second straight Super Bowl. Who knows, who knows what heights this young man from San Diego would have climbed had a serious knee injury not derailed him. As it was, 78 games, 7,600 yards, almost 100 a contest. And good enough that in Super Bowl 32, suffering from a migraine, he went in as a decoy near the goal line, allowing Denver to score otherwise against the pack. To present Terrell Davis, his friend and agent, Neil Schwartz. TD is the complete package. He can run the ball. Davis hand up, first down, Terrell Davis, 45 oh, oh, look out! TD for TD! TD was a great receiver, had great hands. Looks a little, plenty of time. Has a wide open Terrell Davis. First down inside the 10. Breaks the tackle. Five touchdown. Great block. <laughs> the best way to describe Terrell Davis is he's the ultimate team player in the ultimate team game. But in 1995, Terrell Davis was just the Denver Broncos' sixth round pick and sixth on the depth chart at running back. Still, it was the opportunity of a lifetime. I thought that was the great place to be at the right time. Mike Shanahan just became the head coach of the Broncos, and he was the offensive coordinator with the San Francisco 49ers. What I had seen Mike do for Roger Craig, I felt that he could definitely do for TD. And that's exactly what happened. Davis earned the starting job his rookie year, and in 14 rushed for over 1,000 yards and scored eight touchdowns. Davis is the lone setback. He's going to get it, and he's coming up the middle. He's going to the goal line. Touchdown! Terrell Davis, the rookie. In each of his next three seasons, Davis got even better. A three-touchdown performance in Super Bowl 32 earned him that game's MVP honors. Elway handoff. Davis in the end zone. Touchdown! Denver's going to win it! And in 1998, he became just the fourth player in NFL history to rush for over 2,000 yards. He's got it. There it is. And a standing ovation as everybody chants TD. I think what TD did those first four years in the NFL, other than Jim Brown, there's no comparable. He never came off the field. He was a three down back. Knee injuries limited Davis over the next three years retired after the 2001 season but his success is a testament to quality over quantity something his agent predicted at the start of his remarkable career so i'm recruiting td bring him to new york we go to a diner around 10 o'clock at night and we just had a unique chemistry i was like i think you've got greatness written all over you 
I think one day you're gonna be inducted in the Hall of Fame and I would love to do your presentation speech. And he kind of looked at me like I was crazy. And I'm like, no, you get something special and you're gonna show the world. Here we are, we're in Canton. I am deeply honored to present my dear friend, Terrell Davis, for enshrinement into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting Terrell Davis for enshrinement into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, Neil Schwartz. Thank you, thank you. Well, Joe, Joe Horgan said that it's never rained on the Shrine at Saturday. It's raining today. I want to first congratulate my 2017 classmates. Congratulations, guys. Neil. I think back to 1994, when I was still in college and hadn't even been drafted yet. You and I sat in that New York diner for hours just talking about life, family, and everything in between. And getting ready for today, I reflected back on what you said to me as we were leaving that diner. You said, TD, I want you to promise me one thing. When you make it to the Hall of Fame, you allowed me to be your presenter. Well, Neil, I thought you were crazy at the time, but here we are. Thank you, Neil, for believing in me and being such a dear friend and great mentor. You know, it's amazing and surreal to be standing here on the stage when I first learned that I'd been elected to the hall, I was asked how I might feel wearing this gold jacket and standing next to my bust. But I guess I'd be excited, but I really didn't know. But now I can say the overwhelming feeling running through my body today is gratitude. Thank you. I am grateful to the selection committee. I am grateful to be joining this elite fraternity with all these men. I am grateful to my friends and family and grateful to this wonderful game of football. I grew up in Southeast San Diego. The youngest of six boys, all of us about one year apart. And being the youngest was tough, always fighting to prove myself in everything, including football. But there was one special person I was determined to prove myself to, and that was my dad. My dad was tough, or my brothers were tougher on me, because I was the baby of the family. Yes, I was a crybaby. My dad didn't like the way my mother coddled me. But still, even though I knew he loved me, I always felt like he looked at me a little differently than he did my older brothers. And once I started playing Pop Warner football, I immediately fell in love with the football and earned the nickname Boss Hog because of the way I ran. I just tried to run people over. I love the physicality of the game, but I had also convinced myself that playing football provided me a way to gain my dad's approval and by proving I was tough. 
And that's what drove me. I love the game and gaining my dad's approval. But it's inevitable in life. With success comes setbacks. And in these moments, our character and our will are tested. And at nine years old, I received my first test. I began suffering from migraine headaches. Now just imagine a nine-year-old having to, to deal with vomiting, temporary blindness, and painful headaches just to play football. But there again, like seeking my approval, something was pushing me forward to play. And that's what I did. At 12 came yet another test, one that brought the greatest pain that I would ever experience, and that was the passing of my father. When he died, a part of me died. I went into a tailspin. I quit playing football. I was failing school. I was clearly a child in crisis. My daily ritual was hanging out with friends and getting into trouble. But this all came to a screeching halt late one night when I was 14. I found myself literally staring down the barrel of a shotgun. And thank God someone talked the guy out of pulling the trigger. When I got home, I laid in my bed, I closed my eyes, and I vividly relived every moment over and over again. I spoke out loud to God, and I promised that I would never find myself in that situation again. I knew that I had to change my life. God had offered me a wake-up call. I couldn't simply say, wrong number, and hang up. I had to answer that call. That night, I determined that I would walk away from the irresponsible life I'd been living forever. I transferred to Lincoln High School. I worked to get better grades. I joined the football team. Lincoln provided me the fresh start that I needed. I want to thank my late coach, big player, for being a true model, true role model. And I want to thank all my coaches at Lincoln and teachers and all my teammates at Lincoln High. Thank you for being here today. At Lincoln, I played nose guard and fullback. So when it came time to think about college, the best offer came from Cal State Long Beach. I saw it as a great opportunity for two reasons. One, my older brother Reggie was already there. And two, the legendary NFL head coach, George Allen, was going to coach there. George Allen ran our program like he did as an NFL head coach. But sadly, he passed away at the end of my red shirt season. Coach Allen, I know you're listening. It was an honor to play for you. The next season, Hall of Famer Willie Brown took over. But one year later, our football program was canceled. So once again, any aspirations of playing pro football seemed to die. Another setback, another test. My short time at Long Beach State was special. I forged some great relationships that continue today. My roommate, Brian Duplessis, and close friends, Troy Easter, and Malcolm Thomas and Andre Devison, just to name a few. The Hall of Famer Willie Brown, coaches Harvey Hyde and Mike Davis, and the rest of my Long Beach State coaches and teammates, thank you for helping me get here today. The cancellation of Long Beach program made the national news. And as a result, a recruiter from the University of Georgia, Bob Pitter, called and asked one of our coaches if we have any players who can play in the SEC. He answered, yes, 
We have one player. That's Terrell Davis. Now I was off to the University of Georgia. How about them dogs? Now keep in mind, up to this point, I lost a parent, battled through migraines, and found myself staring down a barrel of a shotgun. And overnight, my college football program was gone. But here I am, playing for a program with the prestige and tradition of UGA. God is good. During my senior year, after suffering a torn hamstring, I hit another lo personal low point. However, this moment also served as a time of real introspection. While watching a game from the stands, instead of on the field where I wanted to be, I questioned if I was ever going to play football again. I asked myself, did I give the game all I had? Did I play hard enough? study hard enough? And the answer was a resounding no. That, rea that reality forced me to decide what kind of player I'd become and what type of man I was committed to being. Another test. I returned with four games left in the season, and when I did, I worked harder than ever. I didn't hold back. I did everything I could to be my very best. I walked off that field after the final game, and I could say with pride, I finally did whatever it took. I gave it my all and have no regrets. I love being a Georgia Bulldog and playing between the hedges. My head coach was Ray Goff. Thank you, Ray, for, for being the coach I needed and for being here today. I'm happy to call you a friend. To my running back coaches, Willie McClendon and David Kelly, thank you for being here. And thank you for being there when I needed you. To my second family in Georgia, Preston Hughes and his mother, Carolyn, thank you for looking out for a kid from California. When I was homesick, you made me feel right at home. And thank you to the rest of my coaches and teammates. And to Bulldog fans, I want to say it one more time. Go Dogs! Sick them! Her, 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 her. <laughs> so today, it's August the 5th, 2017. Recently, a friend pointed out that August the 5th, 1995, was the first day of my NFL career. Oh, it was a Broncos preseason game versus the 49ers in Tokyo, Japan. I had one of my worst practices just a few days prior to the game. I thought I had blown my chances of making the team, so I decided to quit. Can you imagine that? I called the front desk at the hotel and arranged for a flight home. But because I didn't speak Japanese, we couldn't communicate. So I couldn't leave. But by halftime, the vets were out the game and were allowed to eat. Thinking I was, I was not going to play, I started eating too. And midway through the third quarter, Special teams coach wanted me to go in. I was pumped. I said, this is it. This was my chance. I have got to make a play. Now, despite having a belly full of hot dogs, I ran down on kickoff coverage and made a huge hit on the returner. And that was my first NFL play. Now, 22 years later to the day, I am standing here with these legendary Hall of Famers wearing this beautiful gold jacket. It's, 
It's so, it's so surreal. I was blessed to have been drafted by the Broncos in the sixth round. And my time in Denver was awesome. We had a lot of success. Our 46 wins over a three-year span and our back-to-back -back championships were phenomenal. But the, but the success of the Broncos organization begins with the owners, Pat and Annabelle Bowling. Their philosophy is to treat each player on the team as though they were a member of their family. When I tore my ACL, Pat was the first to give me a call in the recovery room. Pat and Annabelle, you have been extraordinary owners, dear friends, and your generosity is second to none. Now, Mr. B is at home right now fighting a courageous battle against Alzheimer's. A few weeks from now, the Hall of Fame Selection Committee will be voting on the contributor category. Let's make sure that this champion is enshrined in 2018. To my head coach, Mike Shanahan, thank you for believing in me and giving me a chance to have this career. Your leadership was phenomenal. To my other coaches, Gary Kubiak, Bobby Turner, and Alex Gibbs, thank you for challenging me to be my best every single day. My prompting went out, by the way. We seem to have some technical difficulties today. Thank you. To my quarterback, John Elway. Where you at, John? Back on, brother. I want to thank you for being my quarterback and giving me the opportunity to earn your trust. It was an absolute pleasure to be your teammate. Thank you, brother. To my running backs, the No Limit Soldiers, it was an honor to go to battle with you guys every single game, especially my fullback, Howard Griffin. Jay, say thank you for your unselfishness and your sacrifice. You put your body on the line every single play, and I thank you for that, brother. To my offensive line, you guys were simply amazing. Thank you for making my job so easy. And thank you to the rest of my teammates and coaching staff. We played as a team. We won as a team. Today is for us. I salute every single one of you. But you guys took care of me, so thank you for that. I want to thank Doug West, Jim Sakamano, and the entire Broncos organization. Thank you very much. And to the city of Denver and Bronco fans around the world. I salute you. I salute you, brother. And to my NFL Network family, even though I couldn't play football any longer, becoming a broadcaster allowed me to still be a part of football. And for this, I will always be grateful. To my entire family for a lifetime of love and support. Unfortunately, I can't name you all, but I will name a few. This is a very special man in my life, Frank White. Show your right. You've been, you've been instrumental in my life starting from the first day you coached me at Pop Warner. 
Thank you for your love, your trust, your guidance, and your unwavering support. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you, and I love you, big fella. Show your ride. To my brothers, Joe, James, Reggie, Bobby, and Terry, a lot of who I am came from you guys. You taught me so much. Thank you for always being there and always looking out for me. I knew you guys were always there to rescue me. Even though we don't say it often, today I'm saying I love you. To my younger brother, Kale, and my sister, Jackie, I hope my influence on you was as positive for you as it was for me. I hope you're proud to call me your big brother. Here you go. To my beautiful wife, Tamiko. I want to share with the world what you already know. When you first walked into my foundation meeting in San Diego 19 years ago, you stole my heart. I know you remember on our first date, I said I was going to marry you. Though I didn't yet really know what love was, I did know saying that to you was God speaking through me. Now, 19 years and three children later, I've come to recognize you are my soulmate. You have taught me everything about love. So thank you for being such a wonderful wife and mother. It's a joy to help raise our three beautiful children, Jackson, Miles, and Dylan. It's been a blast watching you. Jackson, my oldest son, it's been a blast watching you grow, buddy. From the first word to your first touchdown, you've made me proud. I love you, man. To my middle child, Miles, I love the way you just tear up everything. You remind me of me when I was your age. But keep doing what you're doing, Miles. That's what makes you unique. I love you, Tubby. And to my little princess, Dylan, the first time you said dad, dad, I was in tears. I cherish every single moment with you. Daddy loves you so much, sweetie. I dedicate this honor of being a shrine to the two most important influences in my life, my mother, Kateri, and my late father, Joe Davis. And here's why. Mom, you are my hero. I am so honored that you are my mother. Raising six sons, taking us all to practices, all while working graveyard shifts and split shifts as an LVN. Not once did I ever hear you say no. And not once did I ever hear you complain. You have a huge heart. If somebody needs help, you always do something about it, which is why you adopted my little brother and sister, Kale and Jackie. I don't know how you did it, Mom. You clothed us, you fed us, and you never left anybody behind. You taught me responsibility to always give back. Mom, you are the embodiment of unconditional love, and I love you very much. <laughs> to my other hero, my father, Although my dad didn't toss around the words, I love you often, through his tough love and discipline, I knew he did. I knew he never wanted me 
I know I n never wanted to live the life he lived as he grew up on the tough streets of St. Louis. And more than once, he'd been shot or stabbed. But the reason I ascribe the word hero to him is that he always did his very best. He knew how to prepare us for his version of life as a black man in America. And his version was harsh. When I was 12, my father became ill. Until he went to the hospital, I didn't know how sick he was. I didn't know he was the original Iron Man. I didn't, didn't matter how many times he'd been sick or hurt, he'd always bounce back, but not this time. My father died of lupus when he was 41. And obviously, my dad never saw me play in the National Football League. Until this day, I think about him and I wonder, did I gain his respect? Dad, I hope you're looking down, smiling, and uttering the words. Son, I'm proud of you. <laughs> Pops taught us toughness and wisdom. My mother taught us courage and compassion. The earnest dedication of both my parents is why I humbly stand before you. Preparing for today, was like preparing for a football game. It has required everything I could possibly give and has changed my life. Sitting in the stands that faithful day at Georgia also changed my life. That day, my dedication to dedicate, my decision to dedicate myself to football and life became my mantra. Do and be my best. Living up to the very high standards of an athlete and as a man. So as I close, in my mind's eye, I return to that frightening moment as a teenager, confronting the most severe crisis of my life. It was in that moment when I discovered my ability to hear God's voice. That knowledge has provided me the confidence to do whatever it takes and the awareness that we are never alone. I've also learned that everything in life has a price. The question is, what price are you willing to pay? The price to quit on our dreams or the price to do whatever it takes to fulfill our vision? I stand before you as an example that no matter what we can achieve if we believe deeply enough, never quit, and know God's hand is always on the small of our back, supporting propelling, and guiding us forward. Thank you. May God bless. I salute you.